Good Wednesday morning. Talk about an imagery. I just got done talking about my family's family dinner. When you read the text from Isaiah, listen, to, boy, you have to, you have to know what it is to have a family dinner, a festa. You see, it's not going. Uh, what you got for supper? It's festa. It's a festa. And when you sit and talk together, eating for hours. Okay. You have to know it. Once, if you've ever been there, you know exactly what I'm saying. If you're not, I'm sorry for you. You've, ne- you've missed out on something so primal in life, so wonderful. This is what Isaiah says. He, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples. Think of my family, my friends, the neighbors. A feast of rich food and choice wines. We drank 20-something bottles of wine one Christmas. Was that what it was, a 20 or was it 12? I don't remember. It was a lot, okay? But we sat there for how many hours? Well, from 11 to 8, nine hours, huh? Something like that. A feast of rich food and choice wines. Juicy, rich food and pure choice wine. My father was a chef. My grandmother was a, a superb cook. Can you? And then others brought food, especially pastries. They brought dessert. It was a festa. It was a festa. See? On this mountain, he will destroy the veil that veils all people. There are no strangers at that table. You sit at that table, you are a friend or family, but you are present and no division, no arguments. You leave your argument at the door. You don't carry that into that dinner. You don't, you don't even, you don't even breathe. Diversity, uh, divisiveness, not diversity. It was very diverse, okay, but divisiveness. You never raised your voice at the table. <laughs> On this mountain, he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples. At this table, we are friends together, family and friends together. The web that is woven over all nations, he will destroy death forever. And that's my hope. That's the great separation is death. Yeah. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. The reproach of his people he will remove from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, Behold our God, to whom we looked to save us. This is the Lord for whom we looked. Let us rejoice and be glad that he has saved us. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. He will redeem us from death. And that's just what I said last time. I'm so grateful that I still have the faith, the Christian faith, because I have hope that death is not final. I say that to my kids in class all the time. You don't believe anything you want to tell them. It's your business. But I wonder sometimes about so many of my friends and who have left the faith and left it completely, not half-heartedly, not jumped in another faith or something like that, but have become agnostic or atheist. I wondered, how, where does your hope come from in the face of death, the great veil, the separation? As one person put it to me once, a very good friend who formerly very devout Catholic, now, I don't know, I think atheist, was an atheist. I don't know, every so often I get a glimpse that there might be some flicker of hope left. But I remember she saying to me to remember her and in my prayers that you, an atheist wouldn't say that. Those are, those are words that just don't come from atheists. They wouldn't. But I, and I think of, well, how do you look at the diminishment of time in life? Alfred North Whitehead, the Anglo-American philosopher, back in 1927, 100 years ago, wrote a powerful line that time was perpetual perishing. And that's a brilliant uh, phrase because everything perishes through time. It grows in time but perishes. So that's powerful because what perishes is all that is good and beautiful unless there is something eternal. Whitehead turned to the etern- eternality of, t- of God and idea and truth, beauty, see? What ha- and that's personal. What happens if there is nothing? What happens? Then all the good, all the beauty is lost. Every person ceases to exist. That's a powerful line. You know, it's a nationally unthinkable line. A psychologist said that one. You cannot think of your own demise, your own non-existence. You can't think of it because you're thinking about your not, think- not existing. You are already assuming 
psychologically, your presence, your existence as the thinker about the non existence it's an impossibility. See? Anyway, I wonder, what do you hope in then? What? When you see that time diminishes and takes away everything, takes away those you have loved and been loved by. Now, what do you do? Do you just look into a blank grave? Or do you hope that out of the grave will come life? I hope. See, I trust and hope, and I'm grateful for my Christian faith. I'm not pious. I'm hopeful. I'm not going around and selling anybody any piety. I'm just hoping. I'm just, what I'm trying to do is witness to my own faith and strengthen in the Eucharist and the church, the, the instruction of hope that death isn't final, that Good Friday isn't as, at least Easter Sunday, that in Christ's death we die and rise. The church is born for St. John on the side of Christ. When Christ dies on the cross, the church is born. Life emerges out of the death of Christ, revealed in the resurrection. I believe that. I believe we live the eternal Good Friday. Good Friday is eternal. And in it, we share in the suffering of Christ. We fill up, that's Colossians, the suffering of Christ. And so we die with Christ and rise with Christ. We do it sacri through the sacraments, the way we live, but the way we die. And I hope and I trust in the great story of Good Friday. I cling everything to that. I'm a passionist. I believe in Good Friday. I preach Good Friday in every homily I give. I never take my eyes off the cross of Christ, the wisdom of God in the world, who can transform time into eternity, despair into hope, darkness into light. I don't want just to get along with everybody. I want to have an eternity of love. I want to be with my family again. I want to be with June again. June and Bill and the family, the friends, so many. I want to be with my cousin Harry again. God, I miss Harry. Yeah, that's the truth. That's the truth. I want to be with those whom I have loved and been loved by. To me, that's the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church. And for me, the church are the people of my life that providence has given me. That's the church. It's those we have loved and been loved by, whose lives we have shared and been shared by. I want that to be eternal. I want to hope for it. You could say it's hoping for nothing. Go ahead. But at least I hope for something. Maybe it is void. But at least I got something to believe in. I have a belief in the advent of life that in Advent, that out of the darkness will come the Savior, <laughs> see? And he will bring with him life and wisdom and grace, see? That's not bad, and it's personal. I'm not a philosopher saying this is some platonic uh, idea. It's, it's the flesh of God himself, Christ. And I believe in that flesh, and I believe in my own, that we share together the fleshiness of God on Good Friday, and hence Easter Sunday. And I look forward to the Easter Sunday in which I will once again be together with all we have. I have loved them and loved by. I keep coming back there, but I mean it. As my old age now, I don't believe in tomorrow in the sense of, in a kind of a, 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 a naive way. I know I'm at the end of my life, but I am not at the end of life itself. And I believe in the life to come, which will be the fruition and the magnification of all that I've had before. I don't know if I said that right, but I will be at the dinner with my family now and my friends now and forevermore, forevermore. The Christmas dinner in Ward Street, forevermore, with all whom I have loved and been loved by forever. I hope for that. I believe in it and I trust it. <laughs>